Hey, we're looking at network security in this video. So first of all, let's define what we mean by this. This is kind of the processes, practices and technologies designed to protect networks from a miss of a keybit attack, damage or unauthorized access. So we're going to start this topic by looking at threats, which is what's in black. These are the three kind of uh, categories or subcategories of that. But first of all, I need to appreciate that attacks aren't always coming from outside your organization. They can come within your organization. In fact, I think 60% of attacks come from inside you know, your business or organization. So actually a lot of it is kind of people with in insider information. So uh, you also need to consider that. And also you need to consider in this topic as we go through how you would maybe protect against attacks using physical security. You assume because we're talking about networks, we're talking about kind of a remote attack. And of course that is a lot of it. But if you've got access to the actual physical servers or routers or computers, and it's an inside attack, perhaps you can just walk up if you work for the company, then you may need physical security too. And these are things like having you know, CCTV as a deterrent and also to catch people, having case locks so people can't just access the hardware inside a, a desktop or a server, and also disabling USB ports. It's quite a common thing people do to protect against transferring malware via USB devices. So bear in mind, physical security falls under this topic as well. You might not necessarily think that. And also, one thing to consider as we move forward is that as cloud computing becomes more prevalent, as we use more cloud storage and cloud applications, you're reliant on the provider of these applications to have good security. And usually these are huge companies like Microsoft, Google, Dropbox. And so you'd imagine they'd have good security, but you are reliant on them. So that might be a factor in choosing which provider to go for. If they prioritize security over everything else, that might be worth paying a bit more to ensure data is protected. Uh, let's start talking about two terms you need to know about. First one being validation, which you've probably come across actually, to be honest, before. But this is ensuring data is correct and in this context secure before processing it. So you don't process data without having a check to ensure that it's correct and won't affect your system. So the most common one would be having, if you've got a website, you want to check any user query inputs to prevent injection attacks, like an SQL injection is a very famous one, and also cross-site scripting works in a similar way. You might use, well, JavaScript is mostly this. Um, and we don't need to go into these in too much detail, but an SQL injection would be like, you have an input box and you type in a query to try and interact directly with a query. If there's not some validation step in between, this will interact directly with your database and in this case, delete this table called students. So you need to ensure that data is correct and won't affect your application before you process it. The second definition is authentication. This is ensuring an entity is who they say they are, so um, are genuine like having a username and password, that's a way of authenticating a user. Also just email confirmations is a less uh, less clear cut way, but it's a way of ensuring someone at least has a username, at least or at least has an email, and so isn't just a bot spamming the sign up. Digital certificates are there for websites and servers. They get issued to kind of prove uh, they are genuine, but they're a bit above this level, so we won't go into it. And also things like product authentication. If you plug in a dodgy cable into your iPhone, you might get a message saying this is not certified and may not work reliably. And in other cases, um, there are mechanisms in place to ensure that you are using hardware that is secure and is designed to work with a device. Now we have some context, let's look at some actual security threats. And I'm afraid a lot of this video is going to be a, a kind of a list of many definitions, but you know, it's just an introduction to this kind of field. So first of all, unpatched software is quite an important security threat. So unpatched software is by definition outdated software because it's software that may have some security holes, some vulnerabilities that have since been fixed in new releases, but you haven't installed the new releases, so the software is vulnerable because the fixes haven't been installed. Updating your software is actually very important in general. You might want to talk about having anti-malware software constantly being updated because, you know, the world of malware changes so often that they need to have the latest kind of threats loaded into their databases. But unpatched software is a specific kind of category of outdated software because actually there is some vulnerability that needs to be fixed. Another threat examiners like to hear about is having misconfigured access controls or access rights. And this is all about having different permissions. So having an administrator, having a basic user, and so an administrator can do more things than a basic user can. And likewise, in your school, likely the students won't be able to have the same access rights as teachers. Teachers can do more, and then you'll have maybe IT technicians that have even more rights than the teachers. So you have kind of these levels of permissions. And if these get misconfigured, like by mistake, a student gets a teacher's 
account. Um, this can cause problems, obviously much more serious than this, this is just an example. Next we have social engineering, a huge kind of subcategory of this and this is manipulating people to give up confidential information. And two subcategories of the subcategory, uh, first of all we have phishing, which is obtaining this private information using a disguised external link. So the most common is to get an email that looks like it's coming from a trusted source like your bank or your school and actually it's got a link that directs you to another website which maybe will trick you to give uh, information or maybe will link to malware but the idea is it's some disguised uh, link that goes somewhere else. Secondly we have shoulder surfing. This is actually can be as simple as just looking over someone's shoulder. This is viewing the private information covertly, so secretly. And so this is you know viewing someone's PIN number as they enter it into an ATM machine, viewing someone's password as they type it in, can be as unsophisticated as that. But it is a threat and needs to be kind of thought about. So the way you might protect against phishing is with education by teaching your staff or your students not to click on links they shouldn't have or shouldn't do to be able to kind of um, notice when you get a phishing email and also shoulder surfing maybe just not writing stuff down or being very careful about entering private information when people are around. Okay a few more to go I'm afraid. First of all let's mention USB devices, in fact we talked about it briefly before in terms of physical security. Well, USB devices can contain malware which can be kind of compounded by having an auto run feature which kind of automatically installs anything on a USB device and it's not just like thumb drives you you can inst you can conceal a, a memory chip in like a keyboard or a mouse any USB device in fact um, and you know this is where maybe physical security gets overlooked because this can bypass any firewalls you have you could have brilliant network security but you can be made vulnerable by USB devices and obviously these are very easy to con conceal. Uh, next we have portable digital devices like laptops, notebooks, tablets, things that you can move around very easily. You can maybe plug an ethernet port into if it's got one and definitely use Wi-Fi. You can move around a city or move around a building just tapping into any networks to try and find vulnerabilities and then run malicious code from that device. But on the other hand, so that's more from like an attacker's perspective, but if you work for the company, if you've got some details, if you've got a laptop or a notebook, it's very easy to steal. You can't really I mean, you can, but it's hard to steal a desktop, it's very easy to steal a laptop, you know, in, in a public place or in a building. So you need to encrypt data in that case. So both digital devices can actually cause attacks, but also they can be stolen and give data to attackers that way. Another threat which requires encryption is eavesdropping. This is kind of the digital equivalent of wiretapping. This is where you intercept network packets during their transmission. So this is very easy to do over Wi-Fi because anyone can kind of view the packets if they're unencrypted and you can also do it with ethernet connections with like hubs uh, you can just intercept any packets and so obviously again you need to encrypt the data you can't really stop it being intercepted necessarily but you can encrypt it so that no one can really understand what it says a final category which isn't really on the specifications slightly strangely is malicious code I mean this is anything that's going to cause damage to your network or to your system and malware is in this category mal malware is just malicious software and there are five main types of malware we can very very briefly outline but I don't think you need to know them so viruses are just code that sits inside a host application and runs when the, when the host runs worms are very similar but they spread autonomously uh, Trojans are disguised as software you want, but actually they have malicious code in them. Adware generates annoying ads, and spyware records details of what you're doing on a computer. And also under the premise of malicious code, we have the injection attacks we mentioned and cross-site scripting. And finally, like backdoors, like when someone writes some code that allows someone else to access the program in the future in the future time. That is an example of malicious code, and there are others as well, but these are just a few to get you started.